This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 16, Mark chapter 9, verse 30 through chapter 10, verse 31. Discipleship, divorce, children, rich ruler. Picking up where we left off uh, in chapter 9, we've been, we've been looking at the uh, this. This understanding of of faith and, and of discipleship, we've and we're, we're seeing too how the disciples aren't um, expressing a, a, a full and under a complete understanding of what it means to be a a follower of Jesus. In fact, are often understanding things through their own cultural norms and their own um, pride and their own um, arrogance. And and we, we we looked at that a little bit at the end of the last time with this teaching about child and social status and the reversal of social status that that uh, that a follower of Christ thinks differently in terms of um, who it honors and that uh, that there isn't to be these social distinctions of value within those who are, are following Christ and I want to want to pick up uh, this this idea because I think it also plays into what Mark um, tells us here in verses uh, 38 with this conversation that um, uh, he has regard with John uh, regarding this this figure who is um, exercising demons. So 938, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Interesting things here in verse 38 before continuing through. Uh, this is a very rare occurrence of where it's a conversation with John and, and Jesus, where John brings something up. And I think it's important that we do know that John brings this up because the, uh, the earlier episode where the disciples had been unable to cast out this demon and Jesus says it can only come out through prayer and we talked about how prayer uh, is a sign of, of humility and dependence on God. Now that group of disciples that couldn't cast out that demon didn't include John because it was uh, the Peter, James, and John had been with Jesus and were leaving from the transfiguration and they come to those disciples and to that, to that group. So John hadn't been a part of that group that had uh, yeah, ostensibly been uh, showing a lack of full dependence on God, maybe an overtrust in their own ability and power. But here in verse 38, we know that um, John himself is not perfectly clean in all of this. So John says uh, that, there's this, uh, that they saw someone casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and they tried to stop him. Why? Because he was not following us. Us. Notice the language doesn't say he was not following you. It's he was not following us. And I think that's important. Because I think what we have a picture of here is that there's these group of people who somehow are not uh, associating with the disciple group. The, the, this 12. But are uh, maybe like almost another party kind of on their own another group of followers, and he's casting out demons uh, in, in your name. And so one of the things you have to ask is, is, is this similar to what uh, the seven sons of Sceva, right, that, that Mar, um, Paul talks about uh, in, in Acts? Um, but I, given Jesus' response, I don't think so. Now, because what ends up happening to those seven sons who are trying to use the name of Jesus as a power formula, you know, because they, you know, and similar to what they see Paul doing, is, uh, it, it, well, it doesn't end well for them. They, the, the, the demon wins in that, like the possessed man strips them of their clothing, beats them, sends them out naked. Uh, and, and here, uh, it seems that they are casting out the demons, and John's problem is, uh, that that this that this man is not one of them, and that seems to be ostensibly the problem. Uh, the irony, of course, is the disciples had shown an inability to cast out a particular demon, and here's a figure who's having some success casting out a demon. But Jesus' response says, "Do not stop him, <coughs> for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me." And so that that reference to G- uh, Jesus stopping is he's affirming what that man is doing and said actually this is is is, uh, this person is probably on the road if i can use that language to coming to um you know speak of jesus and proclaim jesus and then you have verse 40 this proverbial statement 
For the one who is not against us is for us. Uh, A way of Jesus is saying that uh, you need to not count people who belong to you in terms of if they're part of your group. This man who's casting out demons has associated himself with me. You know, that's where he's, he's not against us. He's, he's one of us. For truly I say to you, you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, I think the logic here of 41 and, and 42 is that the response of the, the inner relationship of people who are following Christ is to be one of edification and support, not one of rejection. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to me right, is, 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 is doing something right. And so the positive statement is, will not lose his reward. And the idea is an eschatological reward of, of, of enjoying you know, the being part of, of, of God's people. The opposite of that is 42. Whoever causes one of the little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better right, if the millstone was drowned. And, and I think the idea is better for them to you know, have, have been drowned and thrown into sea than to have received the judgment that comes from causing one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. And so these, this little ones idea, again, this little ones is a status language. These little ones is not about innocent ones. It's about lowly ones, or perhaps ones who are, are vulnerable to, uh, to stumbling, to, 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 to falling into some sort of sin, or, or to, to uh, being, to receiving a rebuke. Perhaps it's even this, this concern is, is, is what, what is the effect of, uh, John, you know, one of the, the, the special three among the special twelve, going to someone and telling them to stop. You know, that, that there's even a concern that, that in doing so, you are actually stopping someone who is affirming Christ. And, and might that be, uh, you know, causing that, that one or one like that to, to, to stumble, to, to stop uh, in their faith. And so I think this picture is also a a rebuke of John and of this idea that somehow they have a special status and are the determiners of who actually is allowed to do things in the name of Jesus or not. And instead of a posture of of affirming this great display against the kingdom of Satan in this exorcism, in this display being associated with Jesus, that this, that this man is doing the very things they were doing when they were in the ministry, and that instead of affirming that, they seem to have a problem with that. Because maybe it takes away from some of their own honor or sense of greatness. And then, and then after this, Jesus enters into a series of hyperbolic examples. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled uh, than with with two hands to go to hell, to Gehenna, to the unquenchable fire. If your foot foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown uh, into hell or Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two two eyes to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire uh, is not quenched. I think we need to be clear that what Jesus is not calling for is self-mutilation. That would have been something in Second Temple Judaism that would have been uh, prohibited. These are hyperbolic statements where where he's saying that, you know, and I think by using hand, foot, and eye, he's getting the idea of the totality of the person, sort of with the, the picture that the hands are the doing of something, the, the feet are the taking you someplace, and the eye is the, is, is the look. And so he's using three elements I think would have understood the whole person, that if there's something in you that is um, uh, contributing to you uh, seeking your own status in this context, seeking your own glory... Uh, you know, it's, you need to urgently remove that. 
because that is the path to Gehenna, to hell. And, 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 and Gehenna uh, is, this, is this place, by this time in Second Temple, Judaism has become a symbol for divine punishment. It's actually a valley on the southern side of Jerusalem. In the Old Testament times, it was a place where uh, Canaanite sacrifices were offered. Uh, King Josiah, one of the things he does is he desecrates that area to stop its practices. And so um, it, it, it moves, it's a, there's a reference to an actual place, but by this time when you look at the literature of the time period, it's also symbolic of, a, of God's judgment. I mean, it goes from a cultic place to really a, 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 a trash reservoir, a dumping ground, to this symbol of, of, of judgment. Um, and, and this is what Jesus is saying in, in, as he finishes out uh, here with, with uh, chapter 9, is... The danger of, of, of seeking your own um, uh, is, is, uh, is, is the type of, of posture that is judged by God. And, and this whole way through on this end of chapter 9 has been um, focused on these, these very, very elements of, of discipleship. On, on, on prayer, on dependence, on recognition of who Jesus is, on help my unbelief, I believe, that humility reference, to, to John not being humble and, and not being accepting of someone else doing that which that group has been doing. And so we're, we're and, and this is, this is uh, all connected to Jesus' statement, his second passion prediction that we uh, began our discussion with that the, the Son of Man will be delivered into human hands and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. That the, son, that, that the picture is the Son of Man suffering, being handed over by God to, to, to human hands. That that's the picture of humbleness and humility and obedience and suffering that is discipleship, something the disciples are not, are not yet understanding and, and grasping. All right, I want to move in now uh, and keep uh, uh, leave uh, chapter 9. Uh, there's a few bits there at the end, uh, but I really want to move in uh, to chapter 10 here um, and begin uh, looking at some of the other of, of Jesus' teaching. You know, with, with chapter 10, 1 through 12, we'll be talking about Jesus' teaching on divorce. Uh, it's set in Jesus' journey from Judea to uh, Jerusalem. Verse 1, and he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. Uh, and and we get, we're getting uh, some instruction here that is similar to the type of interaction that we saw in the first eight chapters, where Jesus is going to be uh, interacting with religious leaders over an understanding of, of, of Scripture. So it, some have argued that this is out of place, and, and, and Mark's Gospel actually belongs in the first eight chapters. However, I don't think it's because one of the things that we're going to see is Jesus doesn't just talk about uh, divorce here. He also gives teaching to the disciples on it. And so it fits that pattern that we've seen after chapter 8, which is instruction to the disciples. So it's not just uh, a conflict story, um, etc. Now, one of the things as we read through this uh, uh, is, is Jesus' teaching here on divorce in Mark um, lacks what is known as the exception clause, which we find in Matthew. And I'll point that out when we get to it. Um, and, and some, uh, you know, it's been argued, has Mark uh, taken out the exception clause? Has Matthew inserted the exception clause, or, or do, has Jesus taught on this on, on, on numerous occasions and taught differently on one on the other? And I think for our purposes, as we, as we think about this, one is, is to recognize, because when we deal with divorce, divorce is a, uh, is a reality that so many of us uh, have, have, have experienced or are connected to people who have experienced it. And, and as that the, the Scripture's voice on divorce um, uh, is... Uh, is not limited to just one verse or two verse, but there is a, a, a larger uh, teaching on it. And I think that's probably, and even Jesus himself, taught on divorce at numerous places. But let's look through here with what we see on um, verses 1 uh, through 12. And he left there, he went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and the crowds gathered to him 
And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up in order to test him, that is, find a way to discredit him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, that question itself is, is interesting. So, the, the place where Jesus is, is talking here uh, is, is um, uh, into this area, uh, you know, through the Transjordan or across the Jordan, um, we'll probably maybe Perea here, or we're, we're anyway we're we're in this we're in this area where we're talking. Um, uh, 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 Herod Antipas would have had some some influence, um, you know, at it, and so we may even be you know thinking this question of divorce and John the Baptist and why they're asking it here. Um, but even more, I want us to think about the question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The reason I point that out is that's not really the question that was typically asked. The question uh, that was debated in, in Second um, uh, Temple Judaism was not, is it lawful, but when is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? So it wasn't a question, does the law allow for divorce, Torah, the, the Old Testament, but when does it allow for it. And so even the asking of this question might be a, sort of, a, a, a bit of a setup of, of a trap. Uh, perhaps they've already heard Jesus teaching on divorce and they're now in an area where they want him to publicly state uh, against divorce. And he answered them, what did Moses command to you? Now, when we're, we're looking at uh, the, the Moses command, uh, notice what Jesus says is, is he simply says, what did Moses command? He doesn't tell him exactly where to go in Moses. He, he, in the books of Deuteronomy, he leaves it a little bit broad. But, but uh, the Pharisees understand him to be at, referencing Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Now, this... Um, uh, in Deuteronomy 24 passage uh, has a um, uh, states where, where Moses is giving a command about divorce, where it says if a uh, if a woman does something that is unpleasing. In fact, uh, it might be useful for us to even think a little bit about the context of Deuteronomy 24. So Deuteronomy 24 one through four, real quickly. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she's been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. So, note, the reason I put this out is a couple things here. The, one is... The main part of the debate in Second Temple Judaism was trying to determine what indecency was. If a man found some indecency in her, right, and writes a certificate of the divorce, so the idea being the man could write a certificate of divorce if he found some sort of indecency. Well, the, 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 the question was, what is indecent? If we look at the Mishnah, where we see some of this debate taking place, uh, the school of Shammai, which had been a particular um, uh, rabbi, said that indecency uh, referred to only unchastity. Where the school of Hillel uh, had a more liberal view of indecency, where indecency could even be extended to uh, spoiling a dish when cooking. That uh, the husband determined indecency uh, in, that, in that respect. So there was a de- the debate was when is it lawful meaning when is something indecent But in I hope you heard in reading the context of 24 Deuteronomy 24 1 through 4 notice how very particular that context was 
this wasn't a general teaching on divorce. It was actually a teaching about when a remarriage is prohibited. So that when a divorce occurs because of indecency, and then that woman goes and marries another man, that, and then that marriage ends, whether by divorce or by death, the first husband is not allowed to take back his wife. And, and, and I think the, the sense of that is uh, the, the first man is not allowed to sort of benefit or, or profit in some way, does not have a claim still on that woman, the first husband doesn't have a claim upon his, his wife now where he, uh, she's expected to return as his wife. And in fact, the entire context of the law there in Deuteronomy is, is has this um, uh, protective measures put in place so that uh, there is, 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 given the reality of sin, there are measures put in place to try to dampen or mitigate uh, the, the harm that sinful actions may have. There's, uh, I'm trying to determine what, you know, when, in, when is something proper, when is not. So even an example, if I was looking at Deuteronomy 23, you're looking at 23, 24, verse 24. This is right before our text. If you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish, but you, you shall not put any in your bag. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So even those references have, are dealing with this idea of stealing. What is stealing and what isn't stealing? Well, it's not stealing if you grab a few grapes because you're hungry. And your neighbor can't charge you for stealing on that. And so the, the temptation to take when something's hunger, that that's, that, that in, a, in a covenant relationship is not considered stealing. But if you start putting it in your bag, which means to help out later, starting to harvest, if you will, that is. That is stealing. And, and so this, this measure, this entire measure of the law, that, um, and, and what, when is stealing, when is not stealing, um, can someone who's d- divorced in this situation... Uh, you know, not um, remarry or, or, or uh, not remarry or remarry. What is what is what is happening there? The whole context is a, a legislated way of trying to control the uh, and define what what is sin and what isn't sin. You know, uh, not affirming stealing, but trying to say what is stealing, what isn't stealing. Not affirming divorce, but putting into practice a protection against the wife um, from being uh, um, uh, used, if you will, by, by the men in that situation. And so I think it's interesting at least to think about the context of, of 24, that the context of 24 is uh, helping the Israelites navigate through you know, some of the reality of being in covenant with God and in covenant with one another, but yet uh, sin and, and, and the presence of sin and evil. So, but they go to that. They, they, they simply say, take it as a given that Moses allowed for a certificate of divorce. And Jesus then responds, well, because of, the, of your hardness of heart, again, now locating the people that Moses is talking to and, and the Pharisees together, he wrote you this commandment. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the rebuke here, if you will, or the correction is, is that they're going to a part of Scripture that was given because, almost as a concession, because of the hardness of the heart. That they're looking at something that the reason that that piece of passage even exists is because the people are resisting God's instruction. And this is to help mitigate through that. But from the beginning of creation, Jesus continues, God made them male and female. Notice he's still in Moses. Like this this reference is still from Moses. And so when he he asks, what does Moses say? You know, part of, part of the criticism is they're not considering all of what Moses has written. They're looking at what Moses said on divorce, but not looking at what Moses said about marriage. That from the beginning of creation, 
God made them male and female. And so we've seen Genesis 1 uh, and Genesis 2 are coming into play here. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let, uh, let not man separate. And so what, what Jesus does on this question of is it lawful for divorce is to say, well, let's first begin considering why marriage. And that marriage, the union of male and female, is part of God's creation design. That he created humanity to be two that become one. That he created not male and male, not female and female, not even some sort of male, female, male, female, but two separate Not simply for separate, but so that the two separate could become one flesh. That 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 design is uh, that design of marriage is woven into the fabric of the God's design on creating male and female. In fact, you know that this that this unity. Uh, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, mother and hold fast to his wife. The idea of marriage then is a uh, a departure from the family unit of mother and father to the new family unit of husband and wife. And so, even the the um, uh, the the whole design is to leave and then to join. And so, and when he's when he's talking about this question of of divorce, one of the things that and going to creation, notice that the, uh, the, the, the significance of, of male and female, father and mother, right? you, you, this pair continues, but this pair is now ontologically considered one. They become one flesh. They're now considered one body, one unit. I mean, that almost makes uh, divorce into this idea almost figuratively of an amputation if you will, because they're not considered two separate bodies together. They're now considered one body. And then, so, um, what God has joined together, meaning uh, the union of male and female, let not man separate, places um, uh, divorce sort of within this, um, uh, this, t- this uh, antithetical relationship that the, to give a certificate of divorce was a human designation that these two are now separate. Whereas uh, the implication of verse 9 is that uh, uh, humanity, man doesn't have the right to separate what God has joined together uh, in sort of an authority context. Now, nowhere in here is, is um, uh, the exception clause. You get a very similar teaching in, in Matthew, um, you know, where uh, you have this, with the, with the exception of porneia, which is an, uh, was inserted as an allowance for divorce. Um, and so here I think what, what, what Mark is trying to convey is, is, not, the, is not Jesus' full teaching on divorce, uh, porneia being sexual immorality. Uh, well, what he's trying to, to, to give is... Um, to draw distinction between the Pharisees are consumed by the hardness of heart exception concession and what that means and not with what was original intent by God, which is what we've seen throughout the Gospel of Mark where the the Pharisees and religious leaders are being accused of setting aside the will of God for human traditions and for uh, uh, human considerations. Now, the, the, it doesn't simply end there because we're in this part where the disciples are getting more information. I'll finish out um, uh, this passage. And in the house, or again privately, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife, um, no exception clause, and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so we've got this further statement where they're asking just exactly what Jesus means and what he sets forth is uh, that just because a written human certificate of divorce may be issued doesn't mean God has recognized that marriage 
uh, as now being divorced. And this is where the exception clause would come in for um, in the Gospel of Matthew. And, and the implication is that they're still married. And that, the, and that the allowance of a divorce to occur on a human standpoint it w- results in adultery in, in from, from God's perspective. Interesting that, that the, uh, the woman also is presented uh, you know, in this as well, which could have um, uh, a reference here to um, Herod Antipas and Herodias and, and, and her separation um, from, from Herod Philip. I want to finish, uh, finish out this, uh, this part on divorce. Notice one of the things that, this, uh, that is being issued here, I think, is a stacking up of the uh, sins that the religious leadership have allowed to be committed based on their human traditions. We already saw that they allowed for the disillusion of honoring mother and father by declaring something Corbin. So, um, uh, you know, that, that part of the commandment, their system has allowed for. We've already seen the religious leadership on the Sabbath violate the Sabbath by a desire to seek to kill Jesus, that, you know, that, that what is lawful on the Sabbath. Um, we've seen them actually use this, be accused of using the Sabbath for promoting human instead of divine intent. And here, I think that the sense is they're also allowing um, for adultery to occur because they're more concerned with the human tradition of divorce. They're even, deba- you know, even to, to debate whether a man can divorce someone you know, over uh, indecency that isn't porneia, that isn't sexual immorality. So the allowance of divorce that isn't sexual immorality is, is allowing parties to behave as if they're no longer married to each other when they are still, from a divine perspective, married to each other. And so we, we're getting a stacking up of how the religious leadership uh, here in, in, um, uh, have, have put in systems that viol- allow the violation of the Decalogue. Uh, and we, we continue to see that play through. And I think this is what um, Jesus is, and Mark is wanting us, us to gather. All right, moving on here, continuing in, in Mark uh, chapter 10. V- looking at here now verses 13 to 16. Uh, and, and here we have uh, Jesus' statement about uh, discipleship uh, as, um, uh, as it relates to a, a child or, or childlike um, posture or faith. It's interesting, we've just talked about husbands and wives and fa- um, fathers and mothers, and now we, we talk about children. So we're obviously working within a household metaphor, but I want us to remember what children are like from a social status, because I think this is important. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not Hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his, his hand on them. It's interesting when we, when we look at this setup. So we have, again, here we have the disciples taking... Um, uh, this position of refusing to allow people to take children to Jesus. And, and, and that, may, that might sound really harsh, especially when we, when we think of children, again, as you know, innocent you know, kids who are you know, looking to go sit on Santa's lap, if you will, in Christmas time, you know, just, just, just pure bundles of joy. Well, in the ancient world, the children would have uh, had such a so, low social status that the idea of of you know, children coming out to be with this figure like Jesus would seem to be such a disconnect. And so what the disciples are doing is they're declaring themselves the, the pre-qualifiers of who has the right social status to come be in Jesus' presence. And children don't meet that. Don't meet their, their pre-qualification. And, and if, we, if we understand how uh, Mark uh, has been presenting children, how it wants us to understand that in terms of social status... Jesus becomes indignant, not because he's not allowing the innocent ones 
to come, but because they're not allowing the lower social status ones to come, that they are making decisions at who should be in Jesus' presence. And remember, this is the exact same criticism the religious leaders gave to Jesus when he was eating with tax collectors and sinners. They were saying he should not be eating with those who are shameful. And here are the disciples doing almost the same thing in a different way, of, of making a determination of who is right for Jesus uh, to, be, to be in the presence of Jesus and who isn't. And, 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 and this is stemming from this continual conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples on how they are closer on aligned to the crowds and to the Pharisees. There's a hardness that is around them that they need to be wary to watch out the yeast of the Pharisees. And this is an example of it, that they, they are doing that very same activity. And so it's no wonder Jesus is indignant you know, this Mark is very expressive of the human emotions of Jesus. And here we have a, a good example of it. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. And I don't think this is uh, uh, speaking to you at all in any shape, way, or form uh, the age of, of conversion or the age of belonging or uh, infant baptism. I don't think any of that is being discussed in this passage. Rather, it is to those like this, to the sick, to the, to the outcast, to the disenfranchised, to, uh, you know, blessed are the poor, as Luke, you know, picks up. To them belong uh, the kingdom of God. And then the statement in verse 15, uh, in the English there's a strength through it. You really see it in the Greek, where it says, Truly I say to you, which is Jesus uh, will often use that to introduce a very firm statement. And then the, the, the whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. The, the phrasing that is used is a way to structure statements uh, in, in, in the Greek to, to stress emphasis. And, and here there's a particular structure um, where, it, where, where the hardest stress could be made. There's this um, uh, um, phrasing that almost reads, um, uh, whoever does not enter will be seen in the kingdom of God like a child, by no means shall enter it. Um, uh, for those of you who, who have studied Greek, there's an u and a me plus a subjunctive uh, in, in the verb, and, and, and that's the, the stress that is, that is being made here. So it's a very strong statement. And I don't think what he is saying is whoever doesn't come with that innocent childlike faith. Rather, it is whoever doesn't come understanding that uh, the, you know, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Whoever doesn't come, you know, uh, without a, a pretension of their status. That to come uh, to Jesus saying, I am someone, uh, is, is a faith that is uh, insufficient and disqualifying. It's only the one who comes like a child, who comes knowing that they are uh, um, lower and weak and dependent upon God, that the childlike faith is not an innocent faith, but it is a, a humble faith, uh, if you will. Remember the Syrophoenician woman. She understood this uh, when she said, even the dogs receive the crumbs from the children, and Jesus uh, affirmed her statement. That the, the, the affirmations of faith is always an affirmation uh, of Jesus as the stronger one, of coming to Jesus, of dependence on Jesus, and not a declaration of their own value, which the disciples all through chapter 9 and here into chapter 10 are, uh, are failing in. They're, they're affirming their value, that they saw a distinction between themselves and these children in terms of value, of, of being uh, a social value, status value, and being around Jesus. So this is... This is, a, I think, a, a harder teaching um, for the disciple sometimes than, uh, than, than often recognized. Um, but looking here then, uh, just introducing, um, we'll be uh, discussing on, on the um, parts of the rest of Mark chapter 10, 10, 17 through, through 31. Um, we'll have to pick up some of this when we get into our next section, but I'd like to begin it. As he was uh, setting on his, his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's an interesting question. Here we, you know, we, here we have the story of, uh, of this rich man 
seeking, seeking Jesus. The interesting question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, often when we think of doing and inheriting, these are completely different realities. You inherit because you were born, not because you, you did anything. I suppose you could do something to lose your inheritance. But that's a little bit the idea. Is In, in this concept, um, uh, Israel was chosen to receive the inheritance. Second Temple Judaism, it understood grace. You know, it understood that, you know, grace in the choosing of Israel. Uh, you know, the, this idea that um, uh, uh, Jews um, only had a works understanding of righteousness isn't actually fully correct. They understood that Israel as a people was chosen to receive this inheritance. And the inheritance of eternal life, that's, the, that's that blending of, of the promises that were given uh, to Abraham and to the uh, and to uh, even it would even extend into Moses and the promised land uh, and, and to Davidic kingdom. Uh, and it has this idea of the eschatological vindicated. So he's talking about this whole picture. But um, while there wasn't this idea of earning your right to get in, there was the idea of needing to do and to obey to remain in. Um, that, you know, that one could be removed from. Uh, you know, one could be kicked out if they violated the law, could be, you know, excommunicated out, um, you know, from the people. And so I think this is the, the question is, is, what must I do to demonstrate that I'm a part of the group that is going to be blessed by God <coughs> eschatologically? So the group is inher- you know, is, will inherit. What must I do to be a part of that, that group? And it's interesting, and there's, there's no indication here at all that he's coming to test Jesus, that he's coming to trap him, that this is, this isn't the Pharisees or the, you know, that are sins. I mean, it's, it, the, the, the way this plays out is this is a genuine question. Jesus responds, why do you call me good? No one is good uh, except God alone. Uh, you know, this, uh, you know, this idea is a very interesting, you know, play where, um, uh, maybe he's attacking the flattery of of the uh, the the young man, the man here uh, who's run up. Maybe he's wanting to begin to create a sense of irony of stress that he you know that he that is right actually to call him good, and that's what he wants to receive is is the the man to acknowledge that you are good in the way that God is good. Uh, you know, perhaps um, you know, but w- w- regardless, the uh, the man is is undaunted. Uh, you know, and he stays there. And so Jesus continues, no one uh, is good except God alone. You know the commandments. And he begins to list several of them, though not all. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear fall witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. What's interesting, these, uh, Jesus refers to the second half of the Decalogue here. Those elements are the interactions between humanity. One he doesn't mention, which is you shall not covet. I think, I think his not mentioning of covetness is one of those where the silence is actually louder than what he said. But he also um, uh, is, is absent is the first part of the Decalogue, which deals with devotion to God. So when he cites the commandments, he leaves silent the ones that focus on honoring of God as well as coveting and speaks to the, to the other ones, the ones that the, t- the, the man replies that he's kept from his youth. And Jesus said, looking at him, loved him, like this is not the references that he has towards the religious leaders, loved him and said, you lack one thing, go Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Notice the come, follow me is the exact same language he's used for the discipleship calls. There's no, uh, there's no um, other language. Also notice that Jesus doesn't say, go sell what you have, contribute it to my ministry. Jesus is gaining no value from this, so there's no opportunity even for the man to to sort of di- have uh, selling it and maybe gain from it by now contributing financially to it. He's to give to the poor uh, again, the lower status of society. He has wealth; they don't, and he's to absolve himself as wealth. 
And also, this isn't a command that Jesus gives to everyone. And so when we, when we look at this, you know, the question becomes, Jesus says, you lack one thing. The man has just said that he's kept all the commandments, but he tells them you lack one thing, and he gives them a commandment of what he must do. He says, you must do these things. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And thus we come back to the commandments that Jesus did not mention. He did not mention the, the commandments of you know, having no other gods. And he did not mention the commandments of coveting. Before there were commandments that I think is being brought that this man had not been following from the Decalogue. And to express his desire to be obedient, to be obedient to, to God, um, meant to do what Jesus said. If he truly wanted to know about what he must do to inherit eternal life, he is to obey what Jesus said. And what Jesus told him was to go and sell, to, di- to di- divorce himself, if you will, from his, his covetousness and his desire for wealth. And, and the man, man could not do it. It's a very, it's a very sad tale um, because he had such great wealth and Jesus loved him, but he could not surrender that wealth. And then, disheartened by the saying, he went away. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciple, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were uh, exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Uh, And and even there in that question of who can be saved, and we'll finish it up here, is is, um, the disciples, are I think, are probably dismayed because in their sense of honor and status, the man who had wealth who has seemingly been also devout, would, be, would have a status where the wealth would be seen as a blessing that God had given to him. And if the requirement is for those who have wealth to, to uh, disconnect wealth, disconnect the importance of wealth, to, to, to be willing to, to give it all away, for the disciples, that seems like an impossibility. Like One that they would be unable even themselves to do, that they're here as people who have left everything, uh, yet they are, they are extinguished, astonished on what, what Jesus re- requires. We'll pick this up as we continue finishing up uh, this, this story um, uh, and talk about the camel uh, proverb and then move on to the rest of chapter 10 and into 11 next time. Thank you. <music> This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 16, Mark chapter 9, verse 30 through chapter 10, verse 31. Discipleship, divorce, children, rich ruler.